Good morning. Morning, everyone. Um, I think kulang ang one our one session ano, to discuss EPR. Uh, we saw very rich uh, and insightful discussions from uh, my compañera, Attorney Ivy, and uh, from Michael or Miguel. Ano bang, anong gusto mo bang tawag? Miguel na lang, Miguel. Okay, Miguel daw. Okay. And um, what I'll try to do uh, in the 10 or 15 minutes that I have this morning is to uh, see how we can extend EPR to meet environment and climate justice challenges in our circular economy world. And um, I think we saw, um, we heard from the two presentations, um, uh, the challenges of implementing EPR, how the government is trying to implement it. And I think we have to laud uh, the EMB, DNR for its efforts so far. Um, for example, by um, issuing the IRR on time, uh, which is quite rare for some government agencies, ano? Uh, issuing the IRR on time and making sure that there are regular stakeholder consultations. So I think DNR can be lauded. And also for, for WWF, uh, for um, spearheading and talking about EPR for several years now, coming up with several studies and policy papers, and now moving to help the government in implementing EPR. So next slide, next slide, please. What I'll do is I'll use uh, uh, three studies, uh, which I've worked on over the past year or so, to sort of frame our discussions and, and, and my, my comments uh, this afternoon. So first, I'll give a, a bit of a discussion on PH legal policy frameworks on circular economy. This was an ADBI paper uh, published last year. And second is um, a study under GIZ on EPR options for packaging. And this study looked at uh, what are some of the challenges, uh, did a bit of a SWOT analysis of how EPR can be implemented in the Philippines. And lastly, this four-piece approach, and I think this touches upon one of the important comments of uh, Miguel, when we have, uh, of including, uh, of social inclusivity, of including the informal waste sector in any circular economy model. And lastly, uh, will EPR bring circular economy within reach in the Philippines? I'll conclude with those slides. Next slide, please. So I'll start with the policy framework. Just um, So first, um, in the paper, uh, in the 2022 paper, uh, I looked at, uh, for a period of July 2010 to January 2022, uh, I uh, studied, I looked at um, congressional measures, proposed bills, and what I saw was uh, up to January 2022 at least, 415 bills and resolutions have been filed relating to various aspects of circular economy. So it's in plastic waste management, general waste management, waste trade. Uh, there were one or two bills and resolutions in circular economy. And what I saw was out of these 415 bills, only one passed, and that is the EPR Act of 2022. So at least I think it would be safe to say, and as we concluded in the study, there's no integrated circular economy strategy or policy in the Philippines. But we can see that based on the general waste management legal framework in the Philippines, there are direct references or even indirect references to circular economy concepts and procedures. Like, for example, in RA 9003, 23-year-old uh, law, if I'm not mistaken, uh, passed in 2000, there are already references to, for example, um, the waste hierarchy wherein there, uh, we should focus on reusing and recycling even before we uh, bring our waste uh, into the uh, landfills. Okay. Next slide, please. So what are some of the what 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 are some of the things that we saw? First, current and existing policies from our constitution to our laws provide adequate justification for circular economy in the Philippines. However, as we can see where the different policies that are being pushed, uh, there is a piecemeal and ad hoc approach. So you will have measures calling for an SUP ban, but it wouldn't be related to let's say strengthening recycling or EPR. Or some of these proposals tend to be reactive. Uh, as uh, I would, uh, what I call the flavor of the times, when uh, a lot of the Canada waste, South Korea, Hong Kong, etc., waste uh, illegal waste shipments came into the Philippines. Of course, our legislators rushed to file bills on banning waste trade, regulating further waste trade, you know, or uh, banning imports from certain countries because of uh, because of those incidents. And what, uh, since and uh, it would be safe to conclude that there was a lack, lack of follow through on these proposals. Why? Because 415 measures, only one passed. And um, as, as most of you will know, policy making in the, one challenge of policy making in the Philippines is we have one house, let's say uh, one, one branch of uh, Congress pushing for a measure 
if it doesn't have a counterpart measure in the other branch, it has to start from it has to start from square one in that branch. You know, so the uh, one thing that was quick, uh, and, and uh, I think many of you will agree, with the EPR Act was the mother and daughter tandem of Senator Villar and Deputy Speaker Camille Villar. You know, uh, the two of them simultaneously passed their measures, and it was moving at the same time. So, nung napasa sa House, napasa din agad sa Senate. Hence, you have your enrolled bill and quickly became into law or lapsed into law uh, without any action from the president. Uh, and another conclusion is there was no real serious push for circular economy law in the country. I think the only law which I saw was a bill filed by uh, Senator Lauren Legarda when she was a uh, one of the deputy speakers in the House during the 18th Congress, pushing for a circular economy framework law. Uh, I'm not sure if it has been refiled uh, under the 19th Congress. Next slide. So what are some lessons from this analysis of laws? I think you need to have a planner blueprint about circular economy in the long run. And POA ML is one, but many of you will know we also have a PAP4 SCP, uh, production, uh, Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production, being led by NEDA. I'm not sure if we have friends from NEDA here. We also have, uh, I don't know, we, have, we have someone from NEDA, I sir. And we also have, for example, a DOST Sustainable Waste Management Technology Development Plan up to 2025. So we have all these plans that needs to be tied together in order to support the circular economy shift. One thing we also saw being emphasized this morning was that we need proper and effective waste management. Miguel emphasized the need to coordinate with LGUs, the need to support regular waste management. Later on, I'll show you a photo of, I think, which sums up the problems of waste management here in the Philippines. I know. And uh, we also heard that it's it's not the whole it's not just a government approach, but the whole of society approach is needed. We'll see more about this. We heard about that. We heard about that cultural and societal shift, and of course other critical issues. And I think most important here is that dealing with the informal waste sector. Okay, we'll see more about that. Next slide, please. So the next study is this one by GIZ with EPR options for packaging. Next slide. Some strengths in the PH legal policy landscape, so we can connect it with the, the earlier study. There's already a policy institutional backbone. There's an increasing awareness of EPR among various stakeholders. And there are different solutions being offered, ranging from using new technologies to community-based or a lot of social enterprises already dealing with the plastic waste out there. Um, when I started my legal career over a decade ago, so it's a long um, one of the first concepts that I heard of was EPR. And a lot of people didn't know about what EPR was. It was actually EPR for waste uh, electrical and electrical and electronic equipment. Wala pang EPR for plastics no, hindi pa matunog. And then eventually over, I think, six, seven years, doon na medyo naging mainstream, uh, quote-unquote, yung dealing with plastic waste. But we, we can't forget, and like what Attorney Ivy mentioned, that there are other wastes which need to be covered by EPR and that need to be recycled, reused, and brought back into the economy. Like our electronics, our electronics carry a whole bunch of metals, uh, minerals, which can be reused in, in the economy. Weaknesses, we saw again, poor implementation, common, and lack of coherence in national policies. So, medyo na reflect yung um, previous findings. Next slide, please. We'll see some opportunities naman. Broad awareness and consciousness of the plastic crisis. And um, as Miguel was mentioning, rising private sector support, which can be harnessed towards EPR success. And uh, as what Miguel emphasized earlier, EPR and any waste management scheme will not be successful if we do not involve the private sector in these solutions. So they are a critical uh, player. Threats, waning political support to push for the circular economy system or EPR, uh, and especially given that new elections are coming up. And uh, several gaps in the waste management system, particularly on the implementation, which may need to be addressed if EPR is to be pushed. Next slide. Uh, the study, this uh, GSS study recommended um, looking at several cross-cutting measures. I think that that's to your left on particularly informal waste sector, eco-labeling, avoiding greenwash. So uh, the, all these uh, other um, cross-cutting measures but you have three important enabling conditions and the EPR options, whether for specific type of plastic packaging or other types, need to consider these criteria. See, on taxes and fees, what kind of incentives, 
how do you push for product redesign or how do you support it? How do you collect? How do you process in several voluntary mechanisms? I think collection and processing are important points because we heard earlier and as emphasized by our WWF speaker, um, the law did not provide for specific recycling targets. We only have diversion targets. When you talk about diversion, it's only taking out the plastic or the waste from the environment. But it doesn't mean that it get, goes to recycling. It only means that it's out of the environment. And I think we need to emphasize more that the processes that are being supported and pushed for by EMB and by the um, government, uh, and by the PROs and the private sector obliged entities need to focus more on that recycling aspect because that's what builds the, uh, the circular economy, not bringing it to the landfill. We're not even talking about yet the challenge of the only Tama po ba, attorney? Less than 300 landfills in the Philippines, di ba? With uh, sanitary landfills lang yun. We're not even talking about the illegal dump sites in uh, Menelig ako na sa isang beach island. Naguhukay na lang daw sila ng... Hindi ko na may mention yung beach island, no? Umamin talaga yung local government. Wala kaming landfill. Bawal magpicture dito sa illegal dump site namin. <laughs> so, balak na lang daw nilang itulak sa dagat yung landfill nila pagka, pagka napuno. No? So, I mean, I mean, it, it shows you the, the challenge on the ground of implementing um, waste management options. And we're not even talking about EPR, implementing EPR yet. Okay, next slide. Now we go to this, uh, what I call the four-piece approach. Uh, this paper was uh, presented uh, in an ocean uh, blue, economy, um, blue economy conference. But I, I specifically wanted to present, uh, to talk about how um, the marine litter, addressing marine litter, misses a critical point. And, and one of the approaches to solve that critical point, and we'll see it later, is, is that, um, that the four-piece approach. So across uh, Asia-Pacific countries, there's near unanimous agreement that marine pollution, particularly plastic pollution, needs to be addressed. If you, uh, and, and in the study that I did, uh, I surveyed uh, several laws in different countries um, we usually see three Ps. So you see the policy, so yung law, like our EPR Act. You see the processes, how to deal with the waste. You have your waste management systems. Processes being implemented by, um, by uh, private sector by, and technology services also. And the pricing. So these are evident in the legal frameworks. You also see here that uh, in terms of a rice-based approach, you have your duty bearers as governments and the strong emphasis of the private sector. Uh, but there's a clear lack of emphasis on the environmental justice component, on making sure that these marine pollution policies, these waste, waste management policies, um, help promote or protect the rights of vulnerable and marginalized members of society. And there is a lack of targets or goals on this. Next slide. So what we re I recommended was a four-piece approach, and that is adding that fourth P, which is people. This helps to achieve this synergistic intersection between marine pollution and environmental justice, and also to refocus the blue economy, not just to spur economic development through our oceans, through our natural resources, but also to ensure that your environmental justice goals, which are critical or core to your SDGs, are also achieved alongside ocean blue economy. And uh, the conference is about ocean equity, so I had to mention ocean equity. And you have to ensure the promotion of a right to a clean and healthy environment, especially those at the margins. We, kanina, we were talking about the informal waste sector and how they may benefit or not from an EPR scheme. And I think we, uh, this is something, this four-piece approach will help refocus efforts towards um, making sure that vulnerable groups such as the informal waste sector are considered. Next slide, please. So how should we do this? Include the concept or the specific language and terminologies in the law. We need to ensure greater representation of vulnerable and marginalized sectors. For example, I understand even uh, some consultations in DNR, co-ops are represented, uh, mga aggropations of junk shops are also there. No? But of course, yung mga nasa far-flung areas natin sa mga lower-class municipalities, hindi nila alam kung ano, yung, ano ba yung EPR na yan, ano yung mangyayari sa kanila being the last mile collectors or waste collectors or door-to-door -door collectors natin on the ground. And, and when you talk about um, addressing yung, yung fourth P na to, there needs to be specific goals and targets to benefit these marginalized members of society. For example, 
if you, although uh, let's use the Philippines as an example, there are estimates that there are about for, for um, 400,000 informal waste sector workers, even more in the Philippines. So now, if you have that number, how many of those do you want to move into formal work or maybe support with, let's say, proper business management of their co-ops, you know, or uh, at the very least, uh, and as I mentioned in this paper, you know, give them a dignified living. Uh, one of my professors before uh, in law schools, yung sinabi nga niya, bakit tayo magsisegregate ng waste? Uh, isipin nyo na lang yung nakakalkal, yung nagpipik nun, di ba? You wouldn't want that person to get the PET bottle which has been wrapped in your tira o yung tinapon nyo na pagkain, di ba? And then, kung ikaw yun, you wouldn't want to be doing that. So, sort your waste para when the waste picker gets it, mas madali for him. And you're, 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 you're in a way helping dignify the kind of work that they're doing. Next slide. Uh, and ensuring a rice-based approach and providing needed technical and financial support to ensure this four-piece approach. Uh, and lastly, to conclude, next slide. So, will EPR bring a circular economy we reach in the Philippines? Next. I think the answer is yes, but EPR is just one of the tools in the arsenal or in our legal arsenal, as uh, Attorney Tony Uposa would mention, to achieve circular economy. EPR is a positive step. It is a starting point for a cultural societal shift. We've been hearing that this morning. It's an opportunity for producers to, to be more responsible and sustainable, but at the same time for technological innovation and ingenuity to shine through. But it's also a challenge to improve overall waste management. I think we cannot overemphasize the need for proper waste management to ensure that EPR will be a success. And we'll see in the next photo. No? Because for me, EPR is not a magic bullet to solve all our waste management problems. Some people think that with the EPR law, tapos na yung waste management problems. We, all our plastic waste will be gone from our oceans and from, from, our, from our backyards. You know? But as, as I've emphasized, this is just one of the many tools that we need. Uh, and it has to be used with other options. And why is that? Next slide, please. Take a look at this. Uh, this is my own photo. Fresh, fresh photo from CDO. We were uh, doing a um, uh, project evaluation work. Uh, seems like, I mean, at, at first glance, parang, wow, something good is happening because wala yung basura dun sa lake, di ba? But if you take a closer look at the picture, it points to a lot of problems in our waste management system. Uh, by the way, the, the trash trap is made out of 57,000 PET bottles. And it's an initiative of DNR. This is in CDO, pala, one of the creeks which lead up out to the, to the port area. So, the, well, nagamit yung PET bottles, but some will say that you know, you're not supposed to put PET bottles and put them in the water because it will just contaminate the water eventually. Look at the trash that's being pushed to the, ano, uh, the trash trap. This area was just cleaned the day before and it had more trash. Well, up on 24 hours, Mary ng basura. Look at the amount of waste. It's mixed waste. The informal waste collectors here who are volunteers, not being paid, being paid almost nothing, said that they don't only collect plastic, they collect wood, they collect dead animals. They collect doors, they collect bed frames, mga kutsyon, mattresses, ano. Halo-halo. So it points to the problem of waste segregation, collection. And it also points to the problem that this barangay is trying to do something, but the 12, 13, 14 other barangays who feed into this catchment or catch basin are not doing anything. And yun sinasabi nga ni Miguel that it's, you know, hindi pa pwedeng one barangay is doing something, the other is not. Because tahitahi yung waste management. Another problem, masaya yung mga nandun upstream kasi wow, ang linis ng tapat natin. Pero tingnan nyo dito sa may lower left. Yung basura na yun, freshly thrown by, sabi ng barangay, residents on the left. And it, it shows you that yung mindset na ginagawa na nga ng paraan ng barangay, yung mga ibang kapitbahay nila are following the law. Pero sila dito, tuloy pa rin ang tapon. And how do they know that sa kanila daw galing yung waste na yun Kasi nakakonstruct lang daw ng bahay. So yung mga tinanggal na plywood, tinanggal na kisame, yun yung mga nakatambak doon. So walang magawa naman yung barangay. I-issuehan daw nila ng OVR, uh, Ordinance Violation Report. Magabayad ng 
multa na 5,000, makikipag-hagel, gagawing 500. Officially, officially hagel yun. May reduction dahil magbabayad ka voluntarily. 500 pesos, but they don't have to clean that up. You know. So, I think this this picture, you know, sums up a lot of the, the challenges. And why? Uh, what what can be done? Next slide, please. My last two slides, sorry. What needs to be done? Again, we have to improve overall waste management. Simple, enforce RA 9003. I've said it time and again, it's a, it's a world-class law. It's a good law. This needs to be properly implemented. Let's segregate proper collection, proper transport, support our MRFs. Maybe the EPR obliged entities can help support MRFs, development of MRFs at the barangay level, um, move towards sanitary laundries, but also recycling facilities. Although 9003 doesn't mandate recycling facilities, it has provisions to support recycling facilities. All of society approach, second point. Um, EPR producers, EPR makes producers primarily responsible But we heard earlier from Yusek Ruth that it's consumers and customers have a responsibility. Government has a responsibility to implement. Tayo have the responsibility to follow the law and to support these measures. Change our behavior, change our habits, change how we consume products. Um, third point, and, and uh, we saw earlier that there are efforts to improve, uh, to implement, uh, laudable efforts to implement the EPR Act, but we need clear implementation guidelines. Um, one, data collection on obliged enterprises. Sino ba sila? Who are they? Um, how do you verify yung mandatory report, yung voluntary reports nila, for example? Campaigns to improve compliance by the OEs and general public. We need clear rules on certification audits, yung third-party audits, and doing the appropriate technologies also. Because we cannot support technologies which, for example, promote incineration, uh, which in my opinion is not allowed under... Uh, our cleaner act you know so we cannot support technologies which um push waste not to a circular model but to you know a final disposal we also have to develop market strategies for recycling to put value on this waste to make sure that you know um people see value in it that's why they will recycle that's why they will reuse and to also help our informal waste sector last slide next please um And as I said earlier, it's not simply diversion, but recycling targets are needed. So we need clear mandatory recycling targets to ensure the circularity. Um, we also need equal effort at reduction of consumption. EPR, as currently worded, I think, in my opinion, focuses too much on diverting, on collecting, but not enough on the upstream measures. How do you, uh, should, we, should we make this mandatory? Maybe that's something that lawmakers can consider. How do we push companies, for example, to move towards cleaner production or uh, what they would call yung eco-modulation, changing their products so that it can be easily recycled or will match the existing recycling technologies and facilities. And lastly, ensuring this four-piece approach to reflect environmental justice. We need to consider informal waste sector workers. We need to consider people living by the creeks, by the esteros. You know, na sila yung nagsasuffer, nagsasuffer yung buhay nila, yung health nila. because of the waste, because of how we consume, how we produce and how we consume products. Um, probably more support for community-based organizations and social enterprises. <clears throat> Over the weekend, for example, I heard a story about a co-op uh, in Southern Tagalog. Hindi ko nalang bibigay ang exact area. No? Um, and they were saying that, you know, they wanted to improve their co-op, push for uh, yung to, to be an EPR partner, but kulang sila ng organizational, yung mga management inside, you know, how to, um, magpipresyo sila masyadong mababa. Kunyari pala yung sa PET bottles, ang presyohan in CDO is 1 peso for uncleaned per kilo. So imagine, isang kilo na plastic piso lang yung makukuha nila and they have to dig it out of the, yung mga estero. No? So how do we make sure na dignified yung work dito mga informal waste sectors, uh, workers natin? And lastly, supporting the Global Plastic Treaty, which, which Miguel mentioned. There is a great push to include the informal waste sector workers to have specific, specific provisions and mandates for informal waste sector workers in the Global Plastics Treaty. So hopefully we see this uh, being included in the treaty itself. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Next slide. Uh, maraming salamat and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for listening.